This show brought to you by Circle of Seven Productions, www.cosproductions.com. Please be sure to subscribe and welcome to our circle. Well, happy Thor's Day, so be sure and tell that. Uh, if you ever see Thor hanging out there anywhere, um, tell him hello because it's Thor's Day. Um, I, uh, my name is Patricia W. Fisher, and I am back after a bit of an absence. I had um, Romance Writers of America conference, and then last week I had a little bit of surgery I had to take care of, but now I am back and ready to roll. Um, and I'm super excited because at my Romance Writers of America conference in Orlando, I got to meet the fabulous J.T. Bach that we're going to talk to today. So let me give you a little intro, and she is anxiously waiting to uh, give us the scoop on all her stuff. So when J.T. Bach was a child, she wanted to be James Bond. Well, yeah, of course. Or Indiana Jones, again, a good choice. Or a vampire hunter or Wonder Woman. Well, of course. Whatever brought her the most action, adventure, and romance while play acting on her stage, otherwise known as her grandmother's basement. Now JT has assembled her own team of action heroes, supernatural creatures, uh, maniacal, uh, I'm sorry, I probably said that wrong, villains, and set them on adventures far from her basement to exotic lands and alternate, alternative dimensions. From a secret location outside Washington, D.C., JT conjures these pulse-pounding tales to share with those kindred readers looking for an exciting escape. Her alternate re- identity enjoys spending time with her workaholic husband, their sidekick rescue dog, traveling to interesting locales like San Diego Comic-Con, and enjoying life to the fullest with an amazing group of family friends and a very good glass of wine. Um, so I wanted to welcome JT Bach. Thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you so much for having me. I'm like really excited about this. This is awesome. And it's, it's wonderful to meet somebody who shares my love of pop culture, especially at oh, a romance well. writing conference. <laughs> you know, it was fun. I remember looking at the list and I saw your the title of your um of your of your sh- of your workshop was Joss Whedon's characterization. I thought, oh my god, why hasn't anyone done this before? Um, so super excited, and you really covered some amazing things. And it's as writers, I think we really want to get into that really deep show don't tell um, that he does really really well. And you pointed out some very cool scenes from Buffy from Firefly, um, and some of these amazing shows that he's done. So what got you hooked on, you know, because a lot of people will just watch the show and go, that's cool. But what made you realize what he was doing as a writer versus just an observer? Well, you know, it really started out with the Buffy TV show. I saw the, okay, I, I feel really bad admitting this, but I saw the Buffy movie. I was not very impressed with it. I wasn't very happy with that one. <laughs> Um, and so I was a little skeptical at first when the Buffy TV show came out out in the 90s. And right. I, I, I got into it a few episodes in, and I was just hooked. And one of the things that really got me right off the bat, I, I was always somebody that was really into not only superhero stories, but I, I grew up watching vampire shows with my mom. We would stay up really late and watch all the Bella Gosies, the Christopher Lee's, the Hammer films. Right. I mean, I – ate that stuff up. And so I was really excited to see a show that was uh, talking about somebody who was, who was this powerful woman, young, well, this young girl becoming a woman. It was about her journey to become a woman and, and how he was able to mix that up with, you know, this, this woman who is a slayer, who's something other than, than us, but she's also dealing with, you know, the attraction of first love and the betrayal of friends and trying to fit in in school. So it was a lot of things that we were dealing with that we could relate to on that level, but also she's fighting you know, vampires and demons. And so it, it, was, it was how he was able to mash that together and make her seem relatable as somebody, like, right. even though I watched, you know, a lot of the vampire films and, like, you had Van Helsing and he was really cool, but he always seemed like a character. He was other. He wasn't somebody that I could necessarily say I am a Van Helsing because he was sort of like this larger-than-life character, like this fairly scholarly guy, but here is this young girl that could have been my, my friend in high school, kicking butt and right. taking names, and 
I, I think that's when I realized there was something special in his writing style, and 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 I I watched him grow through the seasons of Buffy, especially with some of his other writers too that he brought on board, and just really expand the world and really expand the character and the character art. And the more I learned about writing, the more I started studying writing, especially with the the romance romance writers of America I joined in like 2000. And I started taking more and more classes about writing, and I started seeing the parallels in what he was doing and what we were doing for novels. And so that, that's sort of where it began. Right. And what was the first chapter of RWA that you joined? The I joined the chapter? Washington uh, Romance Writers. Okay. Uh, I love, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I live right outside of uh, D.C. and in, in Northern Virginia. And so Washington okay. Romance Writers uh, was the first one I joined. And they were absolutely amazing and just so welcoming and they have this yearly retreat which I do I do not miss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well it's funny because um we have I think three of your former members in our San Antonio Romance Authors group. Um oh, no way. and so yeah, yeah. So I will send you their names but I mean it's it's um it's funny because there's all this back and forth. It's like, oh I know so and so oh I know so you know it's just it's it's really not that big of a community. Um, no. I mean, you think, you know, Romance Writers of America, 10,000 members, and you think, oh, that's huge. But really, mm-hmm. it's not. And everybody pretty yeah. much knows someone who knows someone, you know. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's not that bad. Um, so I do have to ask you, uh, with huh. the news, the announcement on the Steve and Colbert show with Daniel Craig the other night, um, mm-hmm. saying he will return as Bond, are you excited? I am really excited. I mean, I did like um, what Idris Alba was, they were considering him. Well, there was rumors. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, right. I think it was more like maybe a bunch of the fans. I, I, I would totally have been behind that. Um, mm-hmm. I know that there were some, there was some bantering going back and forth or people like saying maybe there should be a female bond. I, I mean, that sounds interesting too. But I, okay, this is going to sound weird, but Daniel Craig has been my bond. Um He's right. Been the first I understand. Bond. Yeah, he's been the first Bond that I've, I'm actually like, he's really hot. Like, I, I mean, Sean Connery was cool, but, you know, he was, I, I was very young when I was watching his movies. And, and um, you know, all the other Bonds, they were, they were really cool and suave and, and awesome. And they were good looking. But I always had this thing for rugged men. Like Harrison Ford was like my first major childhood crush. And so right. I see Daniel Craig, and he can kind of get really stylish, but then he also has this, like, he looks like a street fighter, too. So he sort of mm-hmm. brings that mix. And so it just, it, it, he's like one of the first James Bonds that I was actually kind of really crushing on. <laughs> so right. I'm excited for it. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting because I, I read the books, and um, mm-hmm. it's it's interesting to read the books, and then see how they played out in the movies. And granted, you know, Sean Connery came along very suave, very cool for the yes. 60s and early 70s, mm-hmm. and then one very sad script in the 80s. But um, yeah. And then you had Roger Moore, who, again, was very smooth and cool, but, again, they got a little campy. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, they and got then very had, campy, yes. Right. And then they had Pierce Brosnan, they had um, mm-hmm. Timothy Dalton, and then, you know, of mm-hmm. course, the one guy, George Lazerby, who was in one movie, um, oh, and now, yes. and then they got, to, and then they got to, and the sad part about that movie that he was in, it was a major character development in that movie, and a lot of people haven't seen it because he got yeah. married. A lot of people don't realize mm-hmm. he got married, and then she oh, was yeah. killed by Spectre, and so, yeah. um, you know, people just gloss over that one, but in the book, he's pining for her for a long time. Um, and so when you get to Craig, and I remember seeing the first one that he was in, Casino Royale, and it was like, oh, yeah. there's the edge we've been looking for. It's yeah. that guy who you know is smooth, but you know mm-hmm. he could just like, just take you out and not and just walk away like nothing. Yeah. You know. Exactly. And, and yeah. talk about like, and, and that's a really good point about the pining, you know, for uh, for his his wife because yes I remember Spawn because I I'd watched that um, on Her Majesty's Secret Request Secret Quest right yes. that was the Secret, that was Secret the Service, one yeah. and Secret Service yes Her Majesty's yes. Secret Service and I remember watching <laughs> that you know and I wasn't like that like I'm a fan of George Lazenby but 
I was so shocked that, oh, my goodness, Vaughn was married. And then yes. it, it sort of made sense for what happens next, like with her, him going after their specter and, and, and taking them all out. And, and I thought that him having a romantic relationship, you know, and Daniel Craig, Casino Royale, was awesome because he, cause a lot of times in Bond in the films, he's just sort of like this, he doesn't really grow. You know, we, we're, we're really there just to kind right. of see him kick butt and take names and just, but he really grew in Casino Royale. Like right. You see his whole path and, and, you know, being in that relationship was part of his growth and the betrayal that happened. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one of the reasons why Daniel Craig really resonated with me is because of how well he played the Bond in the first, in the first movie. Well, it's funny. There was a, I was reading, I think it was in Entertainment Weekly, um, that he was at a New Year's Eve party and Sam Mendes was there. And they had had, mm-hmm. a, he, the way he described it is we'd had a few drinks. Because, um, you know, it was New Year's Eve. And he jokingly says, you should direct the next Bond movie. And mm-hmm. Barbara Broccoli is, a, is very proprietary about her, her father's legacy. I mean, they're, they're very, mm-hmm. very specific about how they want it portrayed. And so the next day he got worried because he thought, oh, my God, Barbara Broccoli's going to fire me because she <laughs> he oh, said, wow. I just oh went ahead God. and hired the next the director for the movie, and everything has to go through um, her. And so she loved it. He said, thankfully, she loved it because <laughs> – he was pretty sure oh he was going to get fired. Um, oh so it's goodness. funny to hear yeah. the behind-the-scenes stuff that goes on mm-hmm. uh, with it all. Um, okay, so we've got Daniel Craig covered. And so Yay. I have to ask you, the, the very first uh, Indiana Jones movie, did you see it in the theater or did you see it on VHS? Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember right now. That came out, I think, in, was it 83? That it came out, I want to say. It was 1980, 81. 81, okay, yeah. I think actually I yeah. saw it I saw it on VHS. I don't think I saw it in the movies because I think I would have been absolutely terrified. And I, I was yes. for years of that scene <laughs> where everybody's face melts yes. off. <laughs> the melting, yes. Yes, yes. yes. As a good Catholic girl, I was like absolutely terrified of the Ten Commandments. And so that story yes. had, had had at that point in Sunday school been like, you know, pushed down my throat of like, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the great power of it. So when that scene came up, I was like, ah. I know. <laughs> so yeah, and I think PG. I saw it on TV. <laughs> yeah, and it was a PG. Yeah. And, and a, apparently right after that or not too long after that, they came up with a PG-13 rating. Um, but, yeah, it was cons- – it was and for my kids now, I'm not like, okay, everybody, it's time to, you know, we're going to fast forward through this part. You know, it's a little bit too much. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's fun to watch the music. They get why, you know, people talk about Indiana Jones, those swashbuckler mm-hmm. things. And then I remember one of the things my aunt gave my brothers were bull whips. Um, like actual bull whips to my brothers who were younger. So so it's like, oh, and Aunt Jackie gives you guys bull whips for Christmas, a five and eight year old. Here, have fun. Um and you know, my dad was just like Yeah, no, it was funny. My dad just went, Uh, just take him outside, you know, just like just go and luckily no one lost an eye. Um oh, thank goodness. but they had the best time with those things. They never, you know, got it right but I mean it was just that imaginary <laughs> play and that throwing it mm-hmm. out there and, and oh, I yeah. know that you know you've talk, you talk about how you did that in you know your staging in your grandmother's basement but and there's a lot of mm-hmm. discussion about uh, like Vogue is doing something now about princesses and you know show us a, a different way of princesses sh- as portrayed but I think yeah. that what we all need to keep in mind here is imaginary play is imaginary play whether you are a princess mm-hmm or whether you are Wonder Woman, or whether you are Buffy or Indiana Jones, that Mm -hmm. really needs to be fostered for all of us to grow. I mean, what what is your thought on that? Oh, oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, I I, I think one of the reasons why, well, actually, I think the main reason I write the books that I write right now is because of the play that I did as a child. And the ability to just let my imagination go. And, I mean, I remember, like, my friends and I, every time we would see these movies, and I didn't grow up with, uh, with cable, but I had a lot of friends who did. So I would be over there, and we would be watching an Aaron Jones on HBO and, and all the cable channels. And then we would go and act it out. 
So then we sometimes yeah. we you know this is like way before the internet and we didn't have the script so we would we would watch it and we would quickly like try to write down the lines so we'd be able to get them right. And I remember I bought like a little I got got my mom to get me a little fedora so I could wear it around like any other. Right. And you know yeah. we would just yeah. And so it was just so much fun. We could just like totally pretend that. You know, we had like snakes, and we would we would set up like the uh, the jungle gym area so that we could swing over, like we were swinging over like a chasm or something. And so, I think it's really important. And it's funny that you mentioned that. I was just watching a Vice News report uh, a few days ago, and they were talking about these women that were uh, taking their children, and you know, they were going to these uh, these camps to kind of get away from from a lot of oppression that was happening. Um, in, in Syria, and one of the things they were talking about, this group that I thought was absolutely amazing, it was a group of people that were coming in and playing with these children that are at these camps and bringing them books and bringing them, um, actually, I think it was, it wasn't on Bison, sorry, it was on Full Frontal with Samantha Bay, and they were bringing books and they were actually, like, doing different imagine, imaginary play with these kids to take them out of their circumstances. And, and, and they talked about a lot of say, uh, psychiatrists and all were talking about how important it is to have that imagination, especially when you're in stressful situations. And I think even as adults, to have that escapism of books and to be able yeah. to let our minds wander, it, and it also helps us understand the world better, too, by looking through other people's eyes. Well, sure, and and it helps, I think, just to give your brain, and not necessarily a rest per se, but just to step mm-hmm. back and and use a different part, and then maybe coming back and going, okay, now I can handle this, versus just yeah. building yeah. and building and building, and then you know, um, you know, just being completely mental about it. Um, and and some exactly. of it's just, there's a lot of stuff going on right now, you know, it's, it's a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. So, yeah. With that, um, what so you've got all this imaginary play you're doing as a kid, and you're and mm-hmm. you're cruising along and reading James Bond books and going seeing Indiana Jones, doing all that stuff, mm-hmm. reading comic books Yay. at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. What made you decide? What was that catalyst that said, you know what? I think I'm going to write and create my own stuff. You know, it, it started out when we when I was a kid and we wanted to kind of create our own stories. And so I started okay. writing plays for my friends. So I had a lot of mm-hmm. friends that were in theater. I did, like, a little bit of theater when I was young, but I have some friends that are, like, uber-talented, uh, can sing, dance, do the whole nine yards. And so when they would come over, we would, we would write plays together, and we would act them out. And so that's kind of where it first started, is, uh, is coming up with different plot lines and all for, for our own stories. And then when I was in middle school, I remember – and I think it was more like it was kind of fun to get the attention. I was kind of like, you know, I wasn't like part of the popular crowd, but one of the things I could do was that I could write very well. And so sure. I would I would write these stories. And one of the things I was really into in middle school, because my mom and my grandmother loved like Murder, She Wrote and oh. all those like detective <laughs> yeah. shows. So I, you know, we only had one TV in the house. So I was always stuck watching these detective shows. So so I would be watching these shows, and I, I started, whenever we had an, a, a writing assignment for, for school that was uh, like a fiction assignment, I would write mm-hmm. a story that incorporated people in my class, like somebody getting killed and somebody being the murderer. And so they would want me to read my story out loud because they were like, oh, you know, is so-and-so going to be the murderer this time? Because, you, know, you know, they were all fun the story. <laughs> And so that kind of got me because I got, I got the attention and I thought it was kind of fun. So I was like, oh, this is, this is neat. So that's when I, I, I really started writing my own stuff was, was kind of in middle school, just writing little short stories, more, more to entertain my friends and then to entertain myself and, and now hopefully other people too. Right, through your um, Ultra Security series. So yeah. if, someone hasn't, if someone has not read one of your books, tell me about book okay. one. And, okay, and uh, then how that folds into the others. Okay, so uh, essentially what, we, what I have here is I set up a story of people with special powers. So they're, they're transhuman. So some of the people have been, in this world have been manipulated by their, in their genes to have, like, in surefire way, for example, my heroine has a sure shot ability. And okay. she is chasing this this thief 
who ends up having, who has special powers too, but they're not sure where he has his abilities. He has like strength and agility and and so he's, she's trying to get this thief, and then it ends up opening up into a whole other world. There's a, there's a bigger bad, <laughs> to use South Sweden's okay. term, than, than this one guy. And so I just, I really wanted to kind of do a story that, that focuses on a different character in each series. So I have a story about Shortfire, who's part of the Archer Security uh, firm, which deals with crimes committed by transhumans, crimes committed by people who have special abilities. And so okay. people who, who uh, in this world, transhumans, um, they go after and they find other transhumans because it's a little safer for them than a, a regular NT non-transhumans to do. And so I wanted to concentrate on, the, on different characters each time. And in Surefire, there's a theme that's kind of going on that there's a bigger – big bad each one so there's mm-hmm. the world is in danger the world is in constantly in danger there's always something and so i um, in each book i'm constantly building up that so the two of the characters that uh were in the book in a surefire way it was surefire's boss and her mentor they have their own story in dama x and their own character journey to essentially have belief in their power and also find love because that's really like in surefire way she really the only reason why she's doing this is to sort of get she she wants her father's approval for things she she screwed up when she was younger and she wants to make up to her father by becoming an alter agent and her whole character journey is is the fact that she has to kind of step up and and know that she she needs to do it for herself it doesn't matter what her father thinks about her. Her decisions need to be what's right for her and what she believes is right. And that's her journey in that book. And okay. it also in- includes love, too. <laughs> well, yeah, because, I mean, part of your journey, anybody's journey, whether it's in a, a heroine, a hero in a book or in life, mm-hmm. is to uh, find self-acceptance and, of course, to find where you belong and, and to find love, you know, wh- whomever yeah. that is. Um, yeah. And that's all available on Amazon. And I've yes. got a link up on yes. the website uh, for today, Yay. so anybody wants to go snag that. But you have got another book coming out in November, it sounds like. I do, I do. It is called Time Trap, and it is about Ultra Agent Time Trap. She she uh, enters the scene in Surefire Way. She's Surefire, the main heroine's best friend. And she has the ability to travel back in time, but in an alternate universe. So she cannot travel back in time. In our universe, she has she travels back in time in another universe that runs parallel to ours. So there is a yeah yeah. So I, I was trying to. That's why I have a short that follows Dama X, and that one is actually free to download on Amazon right now. And, and that, that's the grandfather that's the paradox. Time. Yep, yep, and that sets okay. the scene for this one. Yeah, yeah. So she has okay. a big bad in the alternate universe. So yay. <laughs> Yay. So if you want to uh, get ready for the book that's coming out in November, which is Time Trap, pick up the free book off of Amazon, The Grandfather Paradox, and I will set up a link on the website here. But so I see here that you also like to hit Comic-Con. Um, yes. Tell me the most outrageous costume you've ever seen at Comic-Con. And I know that's difficult because people really go all out. Okay, this is going to be a little obscure. Uh, okay, so my, my my husband used to play this video game, and there and now I cannot remember the name of the video game, but there is this one character called Big Daddy in it. And okay. It's essentially he looks like a guy like an old diver, like an old diver suit, you know, with like the metal head and everything. And like in the Scooby Doo cartoon. Girl. <laughs> yes, yes, like in the Scooby Doo cartoon, exactly. <laughs> And that had to be one of the craziest, the craziest outfit I've ever seen. Um, there were, oh my goodness, I, I, gosh, I probably should like post a bunch of pictures up online because now you got me thinking. Because it's been a few years since I've been there. I, I haven't been. It, it's. I had another conference. Like RWA was so close to it this year, so I couldn't make it out. So it's so fun. Right. But yes, yes. Oh my gosh! And Wonder Woman's, of course, galore. Are there's some and oh the the female the female Loki's. I've seen a few female Loki's, which are absolutely amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> 
Well, th- there was a video last year rolling around that Henry Cavill, who uh, you know, played Superman, actually mm-hmm. put on a mask, just like a, you know, just a, I, th- I don't know what kind of mask, but he just had a mask on and he was walking around Comic Con. Oh my God! Um, just a t-shirt oh. and jeans. And then mm-hmm. um, just just walking around, and then he went up to the Justice League table. Um, uh-huh. or I forget who was signing that day, but it was um, whoever's movie. I guess it may have been Ben Affleck. Um, but he, yeah. he w- just walked up and, and asked for an autograph, and then, of course, put it in oh his home face. Yeah, it was funny because the guy in front of him was kind of standing there, and he turns around, and he goes, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's great. I'll, I'll um, see if I can find it. But it was, it was a lot of fun to watch. How just that oh thin piece of plastic changed everyone's <laughs> perspective of yeah. who he was. Oh, oh yeah. look, it's just some mm-hmm. big dude walking around with a mask on. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and know. speaking of that, going back to that, have you seen the um, trailer for, is it Lucky Logan or Logan Lucky? Oh, Logan it's, Lucky. I it, don't know if I've seen this one yet. What is this? Okay, so there's a movie coming out, and it stars Channing Tatum, Channing Tatum I never say his name correctly, and um, Adam Driver, and there are these two, basically, for lack of a better word, redneck brothers who um, decide that they're going to, uh, it's kind of like Ocean's Eleven, and the same director, oh. actually. Yes, yeah. you know what? And so, I, I just saw this. Yeah. Yes, yes, I saw it. I, I'm sorry, I was at, um, I went and saw Annabelle, and they played this before Annabelle. Now I remember it. <laughs> Right, and Daniel Craig is in it. I know. <laughs> so it was crazy because my husband and I think we were seeing Wonder Woman. And uh-huh. they had that video in, and it's like, okay, because they keep showing the guy who's going to help him from behind, um, mm-hmm. you know, doing push-ups or whatever. And when he starts talking, you have to basically refocus your brain to realize that it is James Bond talking like he's been raised in the deep woods of <laughs> Alabama. It's, it is weird. Um, I've actually had friends of mine say, Daniel Craig's not in that movie. And it's like, yeah, he is in that movie. And, he, and they have introducing Daniel Craig, which is even funnier. It is. It's so funny. But You're they right. did that to I Julia Roberts. It. They did that to Julia Roberts in Ocean's Eleven. They said, well, let's say introducing Julia Roberts. Um, they did. I forgot about scene. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was it was crazy. So, well, we have about two minutes left. So um, sure. I wanted to ask, so you've got, you don't have any upcoming appearances going on because you're finishing your books, but mm-hmm. what are some uh, projects that are in the works for you for coming for the end of the year and then 2018? Well, I'm going to be, uh, of course, focusing on Time Trap, getting that out. Uh, I have another book in the Ultra Security series that I started mapping out is, one of the, mm-hmm. I, I, it's one of the owners of the company, and so I have her story, and it's it's kind of interesting because I have to get into her brain, and she's she's so type A as opposed to Time Trap, who's just sort of like, ooh, kind of like this like hippie chick, and so it's interesting to kind of switch gears. But I, I'm really hoping to be able to. I, I had a couple people ask about doing the Joss Whedon workshop at their different chapters. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping to be able to do that. I've been in touch with my uh, co-creator, Kate, who could not be there for the presentation. She came up with the bulk of the presentation. She's amazing. And she's a huge Whedon fanatic, Kate Kate Johnson. And so um, I'm hoping that uh, I might be able to get together with her over in England and do some stuff. So, And I might also, I really want to go to Comic-Con, but I'm hearing that RWA might be at the same time. So my heart is actually breaking. So I'm wondering about maybe going to WonderCon or some of the other cons that are happening out in the West, which I heard are really amazing as well. Well, I have a friend of mine, Tish Milburn. She, uh, Trish Milburn, she goes to Dragon, because she's gone to Dragon Con and really liked it. So that's oh, one I have not yeah. tried. Yeah, That's on my list too. I want to totally go yeah. that one. I, a few WRW people end up going there, and some of them – going for years and are on panels and everything and, and they absolutely love it so yes that is definitely on my radar too so it's hard to juggle them all i mean because there's just yes. too many good things and fun things to do 
So, I well, know. thank you so much for being here today, and I love talking to you. And if you want to catch her books, uh, JT Box Books, they're on Amazon right now. I have a link on the website. She's also, I have a link to her, her own website as well as Twitter. So please come back and talk to us again when you've got your projects going. Thank you. Anytime. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you. This show brought to you by Circle of Seven Productions www.cosproductions.com Please be sure to subscribe and welcome to our circle. 